Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I'm going to start out with a question to the audience. Uh, I'm going to make this a little bit interactive, but there will be lots of questions to the audience throughout the talk. But let's begin with how many folks in the room have a LinkedIn profile? That's cool. Most of you guys have it. That's great. Right. Um, how many of you have Googled yourself lately? It's OK. You can admit it. All of us do it. If you spend 30 seconds uh, and Google my name, and you don't have to do it right now, you'll find something really interesting. Uh, you get the profile of a convicted motor. <laughs> Most people don't have that problem, though. So uh, when other people Google for you, or you Google yourself, uh, you're most likely to find your LinkedIn profile. Uh, the reason I say that uh, is you know, that is your piece of digital real estate uh, to represent yourself professionally. That is your professional identity and profile of records. So really important uh, that you keep it up to date. So those of you who haven't updated your profile in a while, you don't have to, after this conference, go back and, uh, and do that. My name is Manu Sharma. I'm here to talk about uh, data science at LinkedIn. And uh, I'm a data geek myself. So if you see there's five keywords on, uh, on the title, and that's what I'm going to talk to you about. LinkedIn, data science, scale, innovation, and insights. So let's start with LinkedIn. So what is LinkedIn? Most of you guys already know this, but I'll say it again. Uh, you know, our, our mission is to connect the world's professional and amazing work. The company was founded in 2003. Uh, we are on top uh, 26, number 26 in the U.S. Uh, according to uh, the August uh, August numbers uh, from Comscore. We have more than 175 million members. Now this is an interesting stat. The first million members took us 500 days to get to the first million. It took us only six days to get to the most recent million. So that's over two signups per second. So ever since I started this talk, we have added like 600. Uh, and in 2011, more than 4 billion people professional searches, right? So when I say, you know, people are googling for you, uh, your name, this is where they come. When, they're, when people are trying to find other people, that, you know, the data speaks for itself. 4 billion searches in 2011. We have execs from all Fortune 500 companies on LinkedIn. 15 million plus small and medium, medium business professionals more than 20 million college students and recent grads. And it's not in the US. It's not just in the US. Over 60% of the member base is outside the US. Uh, we have 34 million members in Europe, over 25 in APAC, and the site is available in 18 languages. How do we make money? How do we keep the lights on? Uh, we have multiple uh, revenue channels. So we have premium subscriptions when people are either trying to find other folks to hire or when people are looking for jobs. Uh, you buy a premium subscription. We have self-service ads. That's, I can go to LinkedIn and start uh, an ad campaign saying, I want, to, I want to target people in the San Francisco Bay Area with, uh, that are data scientists or analytics professionals because of data people. Right? So I want to spend a couple hundred dollars a, a week. I can do that. Uh, we have hiring solutions. That's our flagship product. That's the market that we're truly disrupting, which is how hiring gets done at scale, uh, which is responsible for about 50% of our revenue. And then we have uh, marketing solutions, which is corporate ads. We partner with other businesses to run ad campaigns. Let's talk data, data science. So as I was thinking about you know, what is data science, I said, let's take a step back and think about what, what is data. So uh, you know, I, present here a few definitions from uh, the Webster Dictionary. You know, information in numerical form that can be digitally transmitted to process or factual information that can be used as a basis for reasoning. This, these are the dictionary definitions of data, right? Or you could go with something that, you know, Reed says data is a new black, but let's, let's stick to this one for a second. By that rationale, uh, I would say that, you know, web logs or data uh, but that's that's not particularly useful, right? I mean, the data you have to you have to parse it, you have to normalize it, standardize it, and put it in a format that can be used. Uh, once you normalize your data, then you have information, and information leads to knowledge. Getting to know how is the business doing? Some basic dashboards, reports, understanding, know thyself. This is equivalent of what I call know thyself. Uh, in, in traditional businesses, and in, you know. Uh, Sort of conventional wisdom says, 
this is this is the extent to which sort of BI, business intelligence, uh, or data analytics in the olden days would be just confined to know yourself, dashboards, reports, how are we doing? But there's a lot more that you can do with data, right? Data then leads to insights about the product. You can identify gaps. So of course, the knowledge part is if, if you can measure it, you can fix it. And then insights is really understanding how are people using your services? What, do you, what can you understand about people's behaviors right, that you can leverage? But at the end of the day, the goal of any data science team is to provide wisdom to the company, to the business, and, and really guide the business. So what should we do and how can we do, do things uh, that are totally based on data and driven by data? So what is data science then? I say that it's the art of turning data into insights and products. Okay. Basic two things that you can do with data. Turn data into insights, turn data into products that people use. Okay, that sounds pretty simple. So what makes a data scientist? A lot of words here, right? So you have to have the right curiosity, understanding, oh, I have all this data, what can I wonder what can I do with this data, right? Asking the right questions, having the right intuition of what questions can you even ask given the data that you have? How do you get the data in order to answer those questions? Uh, a huge emphasis on this. The, ultimately, the quality of any product that you're going to build based on data is a function of the quality of the underlying data. Standardization is really, really important, and we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, you have the right statistical toolkit. Uh, what kinds of methodologies can you use and modeling <coughs> techniques can you use? When are you uh, in a situation where you might be over-interpreting the results, right? Uh, so really understanding the limitations and the kinds of questions you can ask, the kinds of questions you can answer, uh, and then building code uh, to answer those questions. Ultimately, data visualization is a really, really compelling part of data science because uh, the right, visualizing the right way, uh, data can tell an incredible amount, uh, you know, give you an incredible amount of information and tell stories that are difficult to convey otherwise, and having the right communication skill set, because uh, most people don't speak data. And so you have to have a way to convey that information uh, and insight uh, that you come up with. And traditionally, when I, you know, I get asked this question a lot when I go to conferences and you know, present this slide, most folks think, you know, this is like, you know, three or four people, you take a PhD and put them in a corner and they're, in, they're you know, doing their own thing. And then you have someone who can visualize the data and then you have someone who can uh, communicate with the executive staff. Uh, but that's not true. Every single person on my team knows how to do this. All of it. So this is all one person. Uh, as you can imagine, this is a lot uh, you know, to ask for in a person. So the demand for data scientists is really going through the roof. Uh, and clearly the data shows that. Uh, and, and so what, what technologies do we use here at, at LinkedIn or in general uh, in order to enable ourselves to do some of these things? Uh, in particular, at LinkedIn, we use a wide variety of technologies. So uh, Teradata is our uh, uh, data warehouse uh, solution. We use a lot of homegrown stuff, Project Baltimore, uh, Kafka, Azure Bank. Now, uh, three of these four are homegrown uh, solutions. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, we use Python, take R, scripting languages, R for statistical analysis. We use MicroStrategy, SQL, uh, homegrown report for reporting purposes. We use crowdsourcing for a lot of our data standardization. Um, and you know, we use a bunch of other tools for data visualization, GetP, uh, processing, Tableau. So you know, what do you do with the data? As I said, you can do, uh, you do two, two types of things as a data science team. You, you build data products, you turn data into products, and you turn data into insights. Uh, but at the end of the day, your goal is to drive the business. Before you can do that, there are some challenges that you have to overcome. Uh, in our case, you know, we are, it's a good problem to have for us, uh, uh, which is the scale of the data, the amount of data that we have. And you know, I think uh, going forward, I think every business is going to have uh, this, every successful business is going to have this problem. Storage is getting cheap. Infrastructure technologies are, are at the point where you can really store a massive amount of data. Uh, so, uh, how do you deal with that scale? So, uh, you know, big data, clearly big challenges for us. And a lot of the out-of-the-box solutions, you know, don't really work for us. Uh, so, what do you do when out-of-the-box solutions don't work for you? Well, you have to build your own, right? 
And so here's, here's a small example uh, of the scale of the data that we have at LinkedIn. So we process over 200 terabytes of data every day to produce some of our recommendation. Uh, so the, the recommendation-based products are like people you may know at LinkedIn. Um, to over 200 terabytes of data, right? Imagine that. Uh, people you may know was invented at LinkedIn. And I think it was the end of 2006. And back then, we had about 30 million members. And we would compute people you may know results once every couple of months for people. Right? And we had this really cool uh, way of sort of pretending that the results were fresh. So uh, I don't know how many folks are uh, familiar with Monte Carlo in this room, but the, the basic premise of a Monte Carlo is a, is a randomization uh, process which picks, we would pick results uh, in the same proportion as person A was likely to know person B. So we pre-compute a few hundred results for every person on, the, uh, on LinkedIn. And then, uh, and then the likelihood of you seeing that result was directly proportional to the likelihood of the score between A and B. So the results kept getting updated every time you refresh the page, but it was only computed once every couple of months, right? Now we have 175 million members, and we compute people you may know every day, right? So uh, we process over 100 billion rows of data every day. We have up to the second reporting uh, and availability of key events, especially as it pertains to uh, security events, right? So we can, we can flag accounts that are likely to be fraudulent or that are likely to be spammy and whatever. So this is important. You have to do damage control before damage is done. So we have data available up to the second. Uh, and uh, you know most of the web track events, again, they're available up to the second, and then they're available in our data warehouse in, in 15 to 15 minute latency. So how do we do this, right? Imagine we have 175 million uh, people. When you go to the site, there's zero latency in, a, in, in looking at you know, people you may know results, or you click on someone's profile, and you find out how do you know each other, what are the common connections between people, right? So there's a lot of lookups that need to happen. So uh, we, we built pro pro Project Baltimore. It's our distributed key value store. And it does one thing, it does it really, really well, right? And I was talking about up to the second availability of events, Kafka, that's our firehose, it basically publishes every single event that happens on the site. Anytime anyone comes to the site, any click happens, any page view event happens, we track every single thing, and Kafka just publishes that, and then whoever is subscribing to that feed can take that data and process it for whatever they want to do it. And then, again, so uh, our real-time search index is Zoe, right? And you can, with super low latency, find people by name, by company, by title, by skills, whatever you want to, right? Uh, and, and then two different cuts of the data. You can see how uh, you can sort out the data by companies. Here we have this massive advanced faceted search capability. And so all of this is homegrown solution. All of this is, of course, open source. Uh, we we want to give back to the community, right? Uh, now let's talk about you know innovation. So how do you use data to build products? So where do we start? on this profile. So we take all of this information that people provide us on the profile, <coughs> and then we parse that, and then we use that to build, uh, build data products. But before you can do that, you have to make sure that the data is clean. So here's an example of an interesting challenge. So this person uh, works at IBM, and he tells us that he's a software engineer at IBM. And you can see that there are a couple of positions in the here, software engineer at IBM and SW engineer at IBM Research. Uh, any papers on how many different variations of software engineer exist in our database? Any guesses? 50? 2,000? 1,000? 2,000. Ballpark. There's over. 6,000 different ways of saying software engineer. <laughs> so this is extremely important, right? If you, cannot, if you cannot merge them and say they're all the same thing, you cannot do anything with the data, right? How many variations of IBM? Can't be, can be 6,000, right? It's gotta be 300. Any takers? How many, how many different ways of saying IBM? 1,000? I heard 100. Any, anyone else care to guess? 8,000. <laughs> you have seen this talk before. 
<laughs> it is, that is exactly right. More than 8,000 ways of saying I am. That's crazy, right? We can reconcile that. We can say they're all the same company. If you can't say that, if you cannot standardize the data, you will not be able to build compelling products because you you just can't, right? If you, if you don't know A and B are the same thing, and then you can build compelling products. Uh, but the easiest data product to build is uh, something that Amazon has mastered, right? They'll have a different thing. People who view this profile also view this profile. Now that is actually a super powerful way of doing search. Right? If you're looking for a certain type of person, go look at their profile and then look at the browser map. What are the other profiles that people have looked at? But really, as I said before, the most important product that we've built is people you may know. And it was invented at LinkedIn, massive, massive uh, uh, engagement driver uh, as people connect to each other. Um, but once you have once you have clean data, then you can really, really build a lot, do a lot of stuff, right? So let's take another example. Here's the LinkedIn homepage. Uh, there's a bunch of products in here. On the top, you see the LinkedIn Today module, which is like a, basically a custom uh, news module for you, things that are relevant to you in your industry or industries that you're following or companies that are that you're following information about that. And then there's a bunch of stuff, you know, things that's going on in your network. On the right hand side there are a bunch of recommendations about how many of these products do you think are data different? Every single one. And when I say data driven, I mean you could argue, okay, you know, stuff that's happening in your network is also data. It's not just that, it's it's taking all of that stuff and putting a layer of relevance on top of that, right? If there's a bunch of stuff happening in your network, you may care about certain events more than other events, so certain types of events. You may care about when somebody changes of their job more than when people connect to each other. You may care about certain people in your network more than you care about other people. Now, I'm connected to Reed, and I care more about what Reed has to say than somebody else, right? So, taking all of that intelligence into these products, uh, <coughs> excuse me, that's, that's kind of what we do. Uh, so here's an example. Our, uh, one of our newest data products, now it's not that new anymore, uh, uh, is LinkedIn Skills. Uh, and Skills is basically, if you, if you really think about it, what is a professional? A professional is the experience that you bring to the table when, you, when, you, when you're working at a company and the skill set that you have, really. That's, that's the definition, right? It's basically the definition of the skills that you have. How, how do we build skills? So we started again with the profile. And we had this section called specialties, which was like a you could you could you know write whatever you wanted. It was a big giant text block uh, where where you describe the things that you're you're good at and expertise. Uh, well, we did that and we said okay, we're going to parse this stuff and extract a bunch of keywords out of this and build a skills dictionary. And then we have standardized skills. Right now, this is really important because if you don't have that and you have the text block, you can't really do very much with it. But once you have these standardized skills, you can do really, really cool stuff. For example, we build these skill pages. Right? So now I can say, okay, for Hadoop, there's a bunch of other related skills to it that you know related to Hadoop. So if you want to learn Hadoop, there's probably these other skills that you want to learn. The top people who are experts at Hadoop are listed here. Uh, what are the other skills? How fast is Hadoop growing in the in the LinkedIn universe? That's a skill. What are the other skills that are growing with it? What are the top companies that have to do talent, right? So then you have these very powerful insights. Uh, and you cannot do this if you don't have standardized data. Uh, so let's take a look at something interesting. Uh, this is the universe of all the skills on LinkedIn. And every node here represents a skill. And two, two nodes get an edge when the same person has two skills. Right? And then we cluster this. Uh, and then you can find kind of these interesting, uh, interesting patterns. So let's take a little bit of a deep dive into the technology skills. So here we have you know Java, Ruby, Python, coding, coding type stuff. And let's take a deep dive into the skill set next to MySQL. You'll see this is like the big data stuff: Hadoop, HBase, MapReduce. Um, that's pretty cool. Makes sense. They're all together. Let's take another deep dive at that little blue cluster right next to business development. Are there any BD folks in this room? Nothing against you guys. Okay, <laughs> I promise. But let's 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 see who these people are. I love BD people, by the way. So, what skills do they have? Hard worker. <laughs> 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 so 
So internally we call it the BS cluster. But then we So that was a little bit about uh, about data data products. Uh, let's talk about insights. Uh, so how how do you drive uh, businesses and how do you how do you use the data to gather insights? So there's a bunch of stuff that you can do with data in order to get insights. Reporting I alluded to earlier was my version of saying, you know, know thyself. This is just the state of the universe. Uh, but we do a ton of A-B testing at any given time. Uh, I'll ask the audience again. At any given time, how many A-B tests do you think uh, are running on, on LinkedIn? That's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, of the order of a thousand, right? So, because at some point you got to make a decision and turn the test off and make it make it into a feature. So, ten thousand would be a lot. So we do we do a lot of A-B testing. Uh, Understanding demographic trends, who are using our, how are different types of people using our service differently, um, uh, and and then really driving the business. So when it comes to A/B testing, again, uh, there are so many interesting nuances that that happen in our data. Part of it is by virtue of LinkedIn being a network. Uh, you could you could be optimizing one module of a page, and if you are focused on a metric that is only relevant to that module. You could end up optimizing that local metric by hurting a lot of our global stuff. Right? Mm -hmm. So we measure not just uh, local relevant metrics for a particular A/B test, but we have a set of universal metrics that you always need to measure. And and the metrics are universal in the sense that they're not just like okay overall page views or uniques, but by virtue of being a network, there's there are lots of downstream viral components. So is connecting to a to someone the same thing as joining a group. What is the downstream impact when two people get connected to each other versus when they join a group? Like we, we, get a, we understand and we measure all of that stuff. Uh, so I'm going to give you guys some fun examples of insights that we have, uh, we have come up with and exposed externally uh, in, in terms of uh, blog posts. So 2008, you know, the big financial collapse, there was a, a theory that most people who were working in the financial services industry uh, kind of, you know, they left the industry and went to other industries or went back to college. Uh, so we, we wanted to test that and see if that was really true. Guess what happened? They're all here. They just went to other financial services firms. <laughs> so here we looked at the flow, flow of talent from the companies that collapsed. So the le most legal people went, <coughs> went to Barclays, Bear Stearns, went to JP Morgan. First went to Merrill Lynch and then Merrill died and they went to Bank of America. They're all, they're all here. They didn't really go anywhere. <laughs> Which is kind of sad. <laughs> Give them uh, again, you know, people talk about uh, folks in technology and on the West Coast change are much more sort of dynamic when it comes to changing jobs. So they change jobs more frequently than, uh, than the rest of the country. Is that true? Well, guess what? We have the data. And it is true. So the blue line here shows uh, the average number of early career positions for uh, SF Bay Area versus the rest of the country and New York. And you can see that uh, people in the Bay Area change jobs more frequently, have more uh, more positions in the first 10 years after graduating. Now, the other nice thing is the company was founded, as I said, in 2003, but we have data going back to the 70s. Right? That's because people, when they when they fill out their profiles, they tell us what they've been doing all their lives. So <laughs> this is really interesting. So what are these jobs? Turns out. If you're a ninja in anything, code ninja, whatever, <laughs> you're hot. If you're a guru, mm, not so much. So ninjas in, gurus out. <laughs> if your name is Peter, Bob, Jack, Bruce, or Fred, congratulations, you're likely to be a CEO. <laughs> if your name is Chip, you're likely to say Nothing against the chips in the room, that's just for our <laughs> On a more serious note, uh, we have an incredible lens into the economy of the world, right? That's, 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 that's the kind of data that we have. And we are able to understand what kind of industries, how they are growing, how they are shrinking, how is talent moving from one industry to another. Uh, and this is really, really powerful stuff, right? You know, most, I, we are in a unique position to kind of look into this data and understand what's going on in the world. And it's no surprise then that this type of data, you know, makes it into the president's economic report. Uh, this year, for the first time, LinkedIn data made it into the president's report. 
there was a, also an article about uh, about this uh, these trends uh, in the economist. Uh, and then ultimately, though, the whole objective of a data science team is to drive the business. Right? It's all about the business. What should we do as a company? Where should we go next? How do we inform product design that's based on data? So here's an example. This is our iPad. Uh, this is our latest iPhone app, right? So we want to understand what do people do? What features should we build in the hypothesis? And this is this is what we're going to do. Uh, I think it's it's important. I, I do I do agree that uh, you know your V1 of a product when you don't have any data has to be driven by gut, and that's a really important mistake. But once you have data, it's really important to let the data inform you also. Right? So we collect everything about our users and how they use our products and features. Then we can say, okay, what are the what are the drop-off points? How are people using this uh, the apps? What what do they do when they come to the app, etc. To inform uh, the app design, here's a little fun piece of uh, data about how people use our iPad app, for example. So you can see the blue line is uh, the iPad user uh, usage, and the yellow line, the orange line, is uh, is all everything else, a desktop versus iPad. You can see the two. We call it the couch, uh, the coffee and the couch model. So early in the morning, you see that the iPad usage picks up, uh, and then it kind of declines, and then later in the evening. So people use the iPad early in the morning, late in the evening, and then they use the website for the rest of the day. Um, so it's things like this that 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 uh, that we kind of uh, we try to understand and uh, drive the business this way. Uh, you know, my personal view, I've done like both. I've done both types of things, uh, building products as well as doing insights. I think I personally get more uh, more interested in the insights uh, part of it, just because. Uh, it's like playing detective. The information is all there in the data. It's just you have to figure out how to extract it, right? So to answer questions like, uh, if you could, uh, I, I alluded to this a little bit earlier when we do when I was talking about A/B testing. What is the value of an action that a, that a user takes on the site? Are all page views created equal? And the answer is no, because if I connect to you, then you get an email saying, hey, somebody has initiated a connection request. You click on that email, you come to the site, you do a bunch of page views, you initiate a bunch of connections, right? So it's different than me joining a group. Right? So taking all of that stuff into account, are all users created equal? Same, same thing, right? Like different people uh, bring different page views and different traffic to the site just by virtue of the things that they do. Uh, again, what is the early behavior on the site that is going to efficient behavior? If I could get every user to do five things on LinkedIn, what would those five things? and in what order so that that would maximize their future engagement on LinkedIn. What is the value of the user? Again, you know, all users are not created equal. Uh, does mobile usage impact site engagement? This is a really interesting question. Uh, as the paradigm shift is happening right now, where more and more people are starting to use services on their mobile devices, what is the impact of that on website? Is it cannibalistic? Does it mean if people use LinkedIn on the iPhone or the iPad, they're not going to use it as much on, on the web? Because if that's the case, then we really need to start worrying about monetization on mobile devices. But maybe it's it's a creative. Maybe when people use uh, the app uh, on, a, on a mobile phone or a mobile device, they just have a good user experience. It brings LinkedIn front and center in their mind, and they start using uh, the website even more. So how do you understand these types of things? And, and the, there are lots of nuances here, right? So I could argue that the person that's using uh, the app is just the type of person who is an early adopter of technology or who, who self-selected into using the app and is also a very sort of engaged person. So how do you take these personal biases into account when you're doing these types of analysis? So uh, you know, those are just some of the some examples of the kind of stuff that we do. At the end of the day, uh, it's all about the people uh, and the talent, and we are hiring. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. Any questions?